Alrighty, I think it's high time we implemented some obstacles in our 2D Endless Runner. But before doing so, in the description down below, you'll find a link to an image pack, which will contain the player's run and fall sprite sheets, as well as a piranha. So you're gonna wanna go ahead and import them into the project. Once you've done importing, we're going to click the piranha plant, set its sprite mode to multiple, its pixels per unit to 55, filter mode to point, and compression to none before clicking apply. Next, going into Sprite Editor, we're going to make sure the slice of Sprite Sheet into a nice uh, 32 by 45 for clicking apply. Next, going back to our player, we're going to make sure to control click both fall and jump, setting its Sprite Mode to multiple, pixel per unit to 48, filter mode to points, and compression to none before clicking apply. Now individually, we're going to go into fall, Sprite Editor, slice, grid by cell size, we're gonna increase size of X till you see the red borders touching. And yeah, 48 by 48. Slice, apply. Before now clicking jump, sprite editor, slice. And because of our previous settings, we have 48 by 48 and it's a perfect slice. Slice, apply, and we're done with that. Okay, now opening up our scene, we're going to go into our Sunnyland add-ons folder and just drag in our piranha into the scene. Here, we're going to go into our assets folder and go into our animations folder before creating a new folder called Piranha. Open it up and we're going to name our animation just idle as our Piranha doesn't do much. We'll also go ahead and click our player before heading into window, animation, animation. Here we're going to create a new clip called fall, making sure that our animations are together. Now click fall zero and also control clicking fall one. We're going to space them out a little bit. Uh, Zero to five is fine. Oh, maybe not. Maybe zero to 15. Or we could maybe space it out a bit and put four in. That's better. Four zero at zero, four one at the eighth frame, and four zero again at 15. Now let's go ahead and create our jump animation. Selecting our jump sprite, or I should say opening up our jump sprite, we're going to click jump zero and shift click jump two for dragging it in. And when I was testing this out earlier, I found that the sweet spot is actually moving our jump one to, I think it was 12, our jump two to 24, or for actually duplicating jump two and putting it at 30. So we have a nice kind of blip. Yeah, save the scene. Now we can go on to creating our prefabs. So in the resources folder, we're going to create a new folder called prefabs, dragging our platform into it, and also a new folder just called sprites, dragging both our magic clips and Sunnyland folders into it. Just making some space, moving animation down a bit. Okay, so from here, we're going to open up a prefabs folder for dragging both our player and our piranha into it. After renaming it to piranha, of course. All right, now with piranha selected, we're going to go to our tag, clicking add tag, and creating a new tag called obstacle. Going back to our prefabs folder, clicking piranha, and selecting obstacle as our tag. We're going to player. We're going to also select the tag and have it be player. As we do want to control our player, we're going to go ahead and go into our package manager by going to window, package manager, packages, uni registry, and we're going to find input system, selecting it and clicking install. How's your day been? Been good? That's good. During the installation process for input system, it's gonna ask you to enable your backends. You will need to click yes. It didn't come for me as I was tinkering around the project earlier. Continuing forward, we're going to select our scripts folder, create a new folder called platform, drag all three scripts into it. Now we're going to create a folder called player, double clicking it. We'll be now creating our input actions. So right clicking, going to create, and all the way at the bottom, we can see input action. Just name it controls, and make sure to click generate C sharp class in the inspector before clicking apply. With that done, we're gonna add our only input action. We're going to add a control scheme called keyboard. Clicking the little drop arrow, add control scheme, name it keyboard, pressing add to list and keyboard and save. Now action map, name it player before calling the new action, jump. You can double click it to rename fast. We leave it as a button for setting the binding phase, which you can do by clicking the drop down, listen, and just press space before selecting. 
Now making sure to click save asset, we're done with our input actions. Now it's time to create the logic. So we're going to create a new script called player before opening it. Okay, so from here, we're going to remove both the system collections before adding using unity engine dot build system. Before adding our input actions, which is controls. Controls, we haven't added it yet, but we will be using a rigid body 2D. So we're going to go serialize build. Let's just disable pilot for a bit <laughs> next is our animator so repeating the same step serialize build private animator animator and then we're going to add a float of jump force giving a default of 4.5 before adding a simple boolean of can jump removing the update method now we're going to go private void awake and instead of using curly brackets we're going to use an arrow function and copilot refused to turn off but in this case it helped us out so it's arrow function controls equals new controls so we can initialize our controls and use it next we're going to create an on enable method so whenever the player is enabled it will activate certain things that we need so instead of enabling the controls first first we're going to set our player jump and yep we're going to make sure that always when it's performed it will call not jump but on jump and then we can enable our control also make sure we'll put a private just for consistency before of course creating our on disabled method we don't want any of this running if our player is disabled now getting rid of the clean text comments we're going to replace our curly brackets with animator dot set ball is running true and i'll show you a bit later why as we'll be playing around with the animator all right next let's get rid of our errors by implementing our on jump method so, so we're going to go void on jump which will be taking in our input action callback context and we're going to say if context dot performed and then if can jump so rigid body 2d dot velocity equals new vector 2 rigid body d velocity x jump form We'll also be using an is jumping boolean with our animator. I was tempted to use trigger, but for the sake of consistency with is running, um, I, I decided to go for set ball. So, comment is jumping true before making sure the set can jump false. All right, with our jumping dealt with, you have noticed that can jump is just set false. So, how are we going to jump in? Well, oh, do I have the solution for you? We're going to be using on collision enter 2D. So, when the player lands on the platform, can jump is set for true, and our animator is jumping is set for false. So, in it, we're going to be using an if statement going if collision dot game object dot compare tag is platform. If I can type can jump is set true, and our animator is set full is jumping false all right and that's our player pretty simple and uh, let's go ahead and drag it on play inside the uni editor now we won't be modifying the play directly in the scene we're going to instead go to the prefab double click it add component type in player and dragging animator onto animator add component of a rigid body 2d making sure to set the collision detection to continuous we're going to freeze its x position and rotation clicking and holding rigid body 2d we're going to drop it into our field before lastly, actually adding a capsule collider. This is probably a good idea if the player doesn't fall into oblivion. So clicking edit collider, we're going to drag close to the player just for her body part. If you accidentally click off while modifying the collider, you can always just do control Z. It takes it to your last action, it's nice. All right, with that, we're done with our player. Moving on to the piranha. Ooh, actually no, you've been jabated. We're going to go into our animator. If your animator isn't open from the previous tutorial, you can just go to window animation just select animator all right so clicking parameters we left off of just is running all right clicking the plus icon we're going to click ball name it is jumping and now we can deal with our animation so just for the sake of consistency we're going to right click run make a transition click idle the condition being is running false next move up. we're going to jump above here fall below here we're going to say make transition to jump setting its condition to jumping true and then once our jump is complete we of course want to fall so we're going to make a transition into fall no condition before making a transition from fall to run if its condition being is jumping false making sure to set exit time false also otherwise it's gonna look pretty weird when you fall down and it's got this like you know still falling animation the platform's still moving all right cool with that we're done with our plays animator and we can proceed forward to our piranha Ooh. with our piranha it's going to be a bit different we're going to go into our scripts folder and we're going to duplicate the platform scripts. This is because our functionality is basically the same with some minor tweaks for our obstacle. So rename our platform one folder to obstacle, our platform controller to obstacle. 
bit repetitive, but you know, it is what it is. We are just modifying and adding tweaks for quality of life. Rename our platform pool to obstacle pool. Get the idea. And our platform releaser to, you guessed it, obstacle releaser. Double clicking obstacle. We're going to rename our class to obstacle. Otherwise we're going to get errors. All right, with that done, we can basically leave this as is, except as we will be using physics, instead of using the update once per frame, we'll be using fix up before adding a new method of on collision enter 2D with an if condition that checks if the obstacles collide with the player. Whereupon, normally this is where the player would take damage or the game is over, but for the purposes of this tutorial, we won't be implementing any of that. So the player's game object will just be set for. Now I'll open up the obstacle pool, rename platform pool to obstacle pool. I'm using a new formatter, so it's, you know, doing its thing. We're not using a platform prefab, we're using an obstacle prefab. If you're using VS Code, you can just press, double click and press F2, where, and then just rename, and it'll just automatically rename everything else. You could, of course, also use change all occurrences, but, you know, just renaming the symbol is fine, and actually the third method. And we don't have a spawn position, as this obstacle will be spawned in the same place over and over again. And there will be no collision check, but well, there will be. And from here, we're going to create a new float of next spawn time. So serialize build private float next spawn. All right, going down, we're going to rename create platform, create obstacle, and rename spawn platform, spawn obstacle. And of course, we're, doing this. we're going to remove this line from take from pool. I'm also going to go ahead and just rename everything. I'm just getting a bit irritating upon. <laughs> Which you can do using change all occurrences and obstacle. And of course, I'm using some warnings saying indirection is redundant and it would be correct. All right, so scrolling back up after filling up all that renaming and a bit of fixing. We're going to first implement a new method of update. We're going to give it an if statement of time dot time with an equal next spawn time spawn obstacle. In hindsight, obstacle pool could be called obstacle spawner, but what can you do? <laughs> and after spawning our obstacle, we're going to say next spawn time equals time dot time plus spawn rate, which we can just set to 2.5 f for now. Now that we're done with that, we're going to go into spawn obstacle, removing the arrow function, converting it into curly brackets, braces. What do you want to say? It's fine. And we're going to say, we're going to put game object, obstacle, equals what it gets from the pool. Before saying the obstacle's transform position to the transform position of the obstacle. And now lastly, going into our obstacle releaser, same as usual, renaming it to obstacle. Or I should say obstacleizing it. And we're done with our obstacle scripts, are we? Dun, 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 dun. And once we're done renaming everything the obstacle, we're going to remove our spawn obstacle. So we don't want that to be automatic. And with that, we're done with our obstacle scripts. So opening the uni editor, we're going to go into our Piranha prefab, adding the obstacle script to it, creating a rigid body 2D, same like before, set the collision detection to continuous, but only freezing the rotation as the Piranha will be moving towards the left in our game. Drag our rigid body 2D component into our rigid body 2D field. And we want to make sure our speed is the same as our platform speed. So in this case, they're both five. Now adding a box collider. So there's a bit of collision. Make sure it's just a bit, a bit snug for our piranha. All right, that's the piranha done. But as we do need an obstacle releaser, we're going to click our platform releaser and just duplicate it. Why go through more effort, hey? So we name it obstacle releaser, increase the box collider a little bit, removing the platform releaser components while adding the obstacle release. Ah, we still need a pool. So we're going to create a pool just out of bounds. So obstacle pool, or I should say holder. We're going to make sure the transform is, you can tell by dot it is. We'll just say it's going to be here and just here. Make sure it's a bit up as you don't want the piranha falling through the map. Now our platform is polygon, so half the view. So adding the obstacle pool component, we're going to add our piranha prefab to the field before going into obstacle releaser in our hierarchy and dragging our obstacle holder into the obstacle pool. Now make sure to delete the loose piranha in the scene. And with that, we're done with this tutorial. Pressing play. Yeah, our player died. However, let's do a bit of tweaks. We don't want our piranha behind the platform, rather in front of it. So going back to our piranha, we're going to go instead of sorting that as a player. Now pressing play, you can see our piranha coming towards. However, it's a bit too dip at the moment. 
though. So I can change the speed, but I would have to change the speed on the Piranha, which is a bit of a hassle. So a little bit of an extra for you. We're going to go back into our scripts folder. We're going to create a new folder called scriptable objects, just to follow our little trend that we set up. And we're going to create a new script called game setting. Open up our game setting script, removing system collections. No longer will we be inheriting one of behavior. We will now be inheriting scriptable object. Hooray. Also to create our scriptable objects, we're going to add a create asset menu attribute to it. Our file name will be game settings and our menu name, whatever you want really. But for me, it's sleepy koala forward slash game setting. Now removing our start and update methods, we're going to add a public float called game speed, which we'll set to by default and also a public float of obstacle spawn rate, which we will set to 2.5 as default. Now we're going to our obstacle pool, create a new serialized build of game settings. Double clicking game settings, control C. We're going to scroll down to our update method and replace our magic number or magic float with game settings dot obstacle spawn rate. This is really about safe coding, if anything. Before going into our platform controller, and instead of using a float speed, we're going to say we want to use our game settings and game settings dot game speed. Doing the same for our obstacle. Just going to go ahead and control C this, replace our speed variable and game settings dot game speed. All right. With that, we have a bit of safer code. So going back to the Unity editor, we're going to create a new folder called settings. Open it up, right click, create, and you can see our little folder, good koala, game settings, enter. And now we can just tweak our game settings. I already pre-tweaked it, so it sets it free by default, which means if we press play, our platform should be a bit slower and our piranha should spawn and it's terrible. It's gone horribly wrong. Oh my. That's because we didn't set our game settings within our prefab. So piranha, game settings, game settings platform game setting game setting and now our game should be fine it was a lie gone horribly wrong we also have to make sure to go into our obstacle holder and set game settings on there too and press play all right we have some perfectly normal spawning obstacles Ooh. all right if you learned anything be sure to like the video subscribe to the channel for more and i will see you in another video i guess or maybe when i stream you know change it up a little take it easy